In December 1776, the Revolutionary War was all but lost. Uh, many of the soldiers had uh, left uh, George Washington's army after a string of defeats. Others planned to leave at the end of the year after their commission expired. The British uh, troops had uh, gone to their winter retreat to kind of regroup and resupply for the, the coming year. But George Washington had other plans. He planned a daring offensive. Daring because American troops were uh, vastly outnumbered and because it would require crossing the half-frozen Delaware River. Uh, Washington uh, hired uh, as many uh, watermen as he could to ferry 3,000 troops and our artillery across the river. Um, the plan was to, uh, he asked them to go to uh, uh, McConkie's Ferry and, uh, and they would go across after sunset. Uh, but Washington knew that if a single one of their crossings was detected by the enemy, they'd be sitting ducks. That's what made the offensive so, uh, such an uh, uh, amazing and uh, uh, daring offensive. Uh, without it, there probably wouldn't be a United States of America. So they went on Christmas morning. The troops were given three days rations and fresh flints for their muskets. And uh, they began to cross. What Washington had not counted on was a huge winter storm uh, like the East has been experiencing the last uh, month or so. Uh, two American soldiers would die because of it. And the troops, as they marched through the snow, would leave footprints of blood due to a frostbite in their feet and poorly uh, manufactured shoes. But the storm proved to be a blessing in disguise because it provided a cover uh, to, to give them secrecy. Uh, God seemed to have his blessing on every part of the plan. Uh, the British were completely surprised. We only lost three American troops, and we captured over a thousand British and all their munitions and all their equipment. Uh, it was a defining moment in American history. Every one of us has a river to cross. Uh, the dangers of crossing the river are as real as the icy Delaware. But if we face the challenge, we learn that God's power is more than a match for uncrossable rivers in our lives. Today we come to Joshua 3. If you want to follow along in the Bibles we have under the seats, it's going to be on page 215. The Israelite nation had been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. Then God tapped Moses to lead them out of Egypt uh, with many mighty miracles, God brought them out and he promised to take them into their inheritance, the land of Canaan. Uh, Moses sent 12 spies in to check out the land of Canaan and they, um, 10 of them came back with a report that we can't do it. They're too strong. Their cities, many of them are walled, double walled. Uh, they have mighty soldiers. Uh, we're going to get crushed and so God put the nation of Israel in what uh, is, could be described as a 40-year timeout until all the fighting men over the age of 20 had died. Then Moses died, and God picked Joshua to lead the people into Canaan. He, he said, go across, lead the people across the Jordan River and obtain your inheritance, the land of Canaan. Promised land people believe in the inheritance God has given us. They believe that God has given us the same power as he used when he raised Christ from the dead. Now, promised land people understand that we have shortcomings, we have issues, but they believe that God's power is greater. Joshua believed that God could lead them across the Jordan River and in to obtain their inheritance. How do we put God's power to work in our lives? Two weeks ago, I shared with you 
the Reveal study showed that only 11% of Christians today are living a spirit-empowered life. Nearly 9 out of 10 are not experiencing the new inheritance with God's power within them, but are living in the land in between, between Egypt and Canaan in the wilderness. How can we experience Christ's resurrection power in us rather than stumbling along on a fraction of our horsepower? Joshua shows us, I think, three ways. One, we access God's power by keeping our focus on God. Joshua 3, verse 3. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way to before. They are to follow the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River. What was the Ark? The Ark was a representation of God. So to follow that is like they're following God. It's basically a rectangular box made of wood inlaid on top and underneath with gold. It contained a supernaturally preserved manna, a little bit, in a jar, Aaron's staff, and the two tablets of the Ten Commandments that God inscribed with his very finger. The Ten Commandments represented all of God's commands, which are, you know, were, were found in the first five books of the Old Testament. They shared God's promises that he would give the people the land of Canaan as their inheritance. And God never reneges on his promises. That's why it was called the Ark of the Covenant. It represented the promises of God. As they walked up to the rushing waters of the Jordan River, uh, the Israelites had to be filled with fear. How could they overcome their fears? By keeping their eyes on the Ark of the Covenant. Following the ark, God was saying, follow me. Now possibly you have fears about something going on in your life. Maybe you have challenges you don't know what to do with. I had such an experience last week. I grew up with a dad who uh, spent lots of time with me. He uh, flew for United Airlines so uh, as a pilot, so he's probably home half of the week. And... Uh, he taught me how to play baseball, basketball, uh, tennis, golf, ping pong. We camped as a family a lot. But he had at least one character flaw. He was sarcastic. Uh, he did what he called ribbing. He would make little barbs at people that were meant to be funny and, you know, people, you know, people would laugh. But it, it, it was kind of a sharp, cutting remark. And he'd usually do it at the, at the people he loved the most. And so I was a recipient of it a lot. Well, now that character flaw has been passed on to me, and um, I find myself doing that. I don't want to live that way. But particularly when I'm tired or stressed, I kind of fall back into that pattern. Uh, and last week I did that one too many times, mocking, ribbing, and it got me into trouble. And I found myself lamenting, God, when will you help me change? I don't want to be that kind of person that says little mean, cutting remarks to people. I want to be sensitive and kind. Why can't you help me change? Well, I also had a very busy week. It was so busy that I wasn't sure I could keep up. And I started to panic. And then instead I chose to remember how God has helped me in the past and all the things God has done for me and I began to thank Him. And I thanked Him that I believed that He could give me the power to change from a, a caustic, a ribbing sort of person into a kind and sensitive person. When we keep our eyes on Christ, it puts Him between us and our uncrossable river. Hebrews says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, denying our weakness is bad practice because it makes us think that we don't have uh, problems and we don't have to keep our eyes on Christ. Uh, our family enjoys watching Shark Tank from time to time. You know, inventors, uh, entrepreneurs bring their products or businesses in front of five wealthy venture capitalists. 
Mark Cuban is probably the one you're most likely to know. And uh, if you watch it, you may remember the time that they did the skinny mirror. Uh, skinny mirror was, uh, you know, glass that uh, was made, you know, kind of provided an optical uh, illusion. Uh, you, look, you look in the mirror and you look 10 pounds lighter. Well, their idea was to sell it to individuals, but retailers picked up on it. Uh, they realized they put these mirrors in their fitting rooms and people look better, they're more likely to buy their clothes. Um, the funny thing about it is that they don't make any, uh, they don't, you know, try to make any secrets about it. They put their logo, Skinny Mirror, right on the mirror. So next time you're in a fitting room and you're trying on skinny jeans, whatever you do, don't look at the bottom right-hand corner of the mirror. You might be devastated. I mean, think about it. There can be other products uh, that you could make uh, to go along with the Skinny Mirror. I mean, you, you're looking in the mirror, you look good. So why not make a skinny scale? You know, it'll show you 10 pounds lighter than you really are. So you're looking good and this will back it up. Or how about the skinny bowl? You want to have yourself a, a pint of ice cream, but you feel kind of guilty about it. So you put it in the skinny bowl. You're still getting the same. That's okay. But it looks like you're having less. So you look good. The scale backs it up, but what about your blind date? What will they see? No problem. You bring along the skinny glasses. Ask them to put them on, and they'll see you the way you want them to see you. Denying our weakness can be a lucrative business. Admitting our weakness, or weaknesses, and keeping our eyes on Jesus is the first key to accessing God's power. Two, we access God's power by taking tiny steps of faith. Verse 5, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up, went ahead of them, and the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here. Listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the Lord your God is among you, that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, and the Soundbites, and the Megabites, <laughs> the Terabites, and the Gummy Bites. You may wonder at the fairness of God driving out the people of Canaan. Well, you have to remember that all people have as their ancestor Noah. These people knew the truths about God, just like the Israelites did, but they chose not to believe. They went another direction. God gave them over 500 years to repent. And had they, he would have ha happily welcomed them into his family. So remember, God is always fair with people. Verse 11, see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Remember, it represents God, so they're following God across the Jordan. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. The people, seeing the Jordan River rushing by, it appeared to be an impossibility to get across. I can imagine as they approached the river, the feelings of some of the people would be like us standing at the edge of the Columbia River after a Pacific Northwest snowstorm or rainstorm and there's wind and we're supposed to cross, but there's no I-5 there's no I-205 to walk across. There's no Portland spirit uh, to, to ferry us across. And we're thinking, why do it now while it's snowing and raining? Uh, why not wait until the storm goes away and maybe it gets warmer and the, and the river slows down and, and goes down? And maybe we could wade across part of the way. That's what many, many of the people were thinking. 
Uh, during many months of the year, the Jordan, uh, we estimate, was only about 100 feet wide. But during flood stage, which is when they were there, uh, scholars uh, suggest that in some places it could be as much as a mile wide. So crossing the Jordan River was no small task, especially with so many people that God wanted to get across. God wanted every man, woman, child to cross the river, not just the hardy and healthy, but the old and feeble, the sick and disabled. No one was to be left behind. Joshua had to gulp at the prospect of getting two million people across the Jordan River. Yet he set the process in motion. Early in the morning, he led the people to the banks of the Jordan where they camped for three days. For three days, they watched and waited, seeing the yeasty debris or what waves carrying the debris and trunks of trees down the river. For three nights, they slept or tried to sleep, hearing the endless rush of the water in the dark. Three days, plenty of times to ask questions. How are we going to get across? Is somebody going to make a boat? Is somebody going to build a bridge? How will we get all the people? How about the children? How are we going to get across a flooded, bridgeless, boatless river? They were soon to get their answers. The priest went first, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, followed by some of the soldiers. People stepped out of their tents and watched as the priest inched their way down the banks to the Jordan River. The only sound was the sound of the rush of water. It shown, showed no sign of stopping. When they were 30 feet from the river bank, the Jordan was a rushing current. 20 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet, still no stopping of the river. Fast and furious. When the priests were just a single step from the river, the water was still rushing by. Surely they paused and thought to themselves, should we proceed? I mean, it's likely to knock us over and we'll lose the Ark of the Covenant. But then they remembered what Joshua said, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua does not veil their fear. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the priests didn't run into the river. They didn't dive. They just touched the edge of their toes into the river. It was the smallest of steps. But with God, the smallest of steps can lead to the mightiest of miracles. As they touched the water, it's as if someone stopped the, the water main. And the water, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. I always pictured this as a big wall of water and the Israelites walking by with this wall by them going through. But Adam was a city where God stopped the water and it was 30 miles upstream. In other words, God made a wide passageway for the people, for two million people, to get across in mass. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. All the people crossed over on dry ground. The men, the women, the old, the young, believers, doubters, the faithful, and the murmurers. All Israel crossed over on dry ground. It might as well have been concrete. No wagon wheels got stuck. No people got their feet damp. As the people crossed over and stood on the other side looking back, there must have been a lot of high fives saying, wow, did you see that? They were brimming with confidence. God did that. Now we know God is going to help us to obtain our inheritance and drive out the Canaanites. It, the bicycle race was downhill with the wind at their backs. They had every reason to celebrate. And so do we. 
For Joshua's people, assurance came as they stood on the other side of the Jordan looking back. For us, our assurance comes as we look back at the work Jesus finished on the cross. Sin paid for. Death disarmed. Satan defeated. New inheritance life embedded in every one of us who believe in Jesus Christ. The river we could not cross, Jesus crossed it. The tide we could not face, he faced it for us. Like the Hebrews, we have been dramatically delivered. But are we deeply convinced? Remember, the Hebrews could have entered the land of Canaan four decades earlier. They too had had an amazing miracle as God parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground. What's the difference between that crossing and this one? This time, the Israelites were convinced that God was with them. They paid attention. The miracle at the Jordan is important because it gave the people a first-hand experience of the power of God. Most of the Israelites were just children when God brought them out of Egypt. Or some of them were born in the wilderness. Uh, they had heard <clears throat> God's amazing miracles bringing them out of Egypt from their parents, maybe grandparents. But they hadn't experienced a first-hand miracle. This miracle made them first-generation believers. Uh, parents, to make disciples of your children, you want your kids to become first-generation believers. If all they know about Christ is from you, they're second-generation believers. They have a second-hand faith. It's only when they experience answers to their own prayers and see God's mighty power in their own lives that they become first-generation believers. You need to help them to find their first-generation faith. Your kids and you access God's power by taking tiny steps of faith. You don't have to be a four-star letterman, a hero of the faith. Just take tiny steps of faith. Empty nester, married person, young single person, teenager. Take tiny steps of faith at work or school with your homework and watch God move. We access God's power by focusing on God, by taking tiny steps of faith, and third, we access God's power by remembering what God has done. Memory is an important part of our faith. To help the Israelites not forget, God told uh, each of the tribes to pick one leader and to go to the center of the Jordan, pick up one rock, I assume it's a huge rock, as much as a guy could carry, and take it and then make a monument of 12 stones. So then, when the child, their children would ask, what are these stones? They could say, this is when God parted the Jordan River. And uh, I was there. I saw it happen. It was amazing. Verse 18, And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan, he said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Uh, faith reminders are very important for us. I see my role as not so much to find new truths for you that you've never heard before. Uh, I discover them as I read the Bible, new things I haven't seen before, but primarily I see myself as bringing you back to old truths that you've known before, foundational principles. And the one we're looking at in this series, putting God's power to work in your life, is the foundational principle that every believer has the same power within them that God used when he raised Christ from the dead. A girl was healthy, 
strong until she was 11 years old. And then her legs gave out and she couldn't walk and her arms became immobile and she couldn't feed herself. And she went into a coma, into a vegetative state. The doctors didn't know what, what had happened. But he told the parents that she would never come out of this vegetative state. But the parents, against all odds, believed that he would help their daughter. God would help her and bring, bring her back. And uh, her parents would sit by her bedside and her three brothers. She was uh, a triplet, so it had twin brothers and uh, an older brother. And they would talk to her just like she was there with them, believing that God was going to bring her back. Two years later, she woke up on the inside. She could hear, and she could hear the doctors telling her parents that your, da your daughter's never coming back, never going to come out of this coma. But she was alive inside. And uh, her parents used to watch uh, Joel Olstein on the TV in her room, and he talked one time about God being a healer. He said, you are a victor, not a victim. And so she would say that over and over to herself. I'm a victor, not a victim. And she prayed that God would show her family a sign that she was awake on the inside. And it was after three years that she was finally able to open her eyes. And her mother said to her, blink once if you can hear me. And she blinked once. That was the beginning of a long journey back she got stronger and she could eat again. She could feed herself. September 10th, 2010, she was cleared to go back to school. But the doctor said she'll never walk again. She'll always be in a wheelchair. But she kept working, getting stronger. She was a swimmer before she went into the hospital. And so one day her brothers just literally threw her in the pool. She found that she could still swim. It just came right back to her and she got stronger and she entered the Paralympics. She got two silver medals. Eventually, she could walk again, and she got strong, and she's now one of the youngest commentators on ESPN, uh, an actress, a model, and uh, there she is. So Victoria Arlen, uh, and she in the 2016-17 season, she was on Dancing with the Stars, and her partner was uh, Val Shermkowski. Uh, the pro. Victoria believed that God is a healer. She believed in her inheritance, that she was a victor, not a victim, that she had the same power within her that God used when He raised Christ from the dead. And you can experience the same thing. Jordan is behind you. Canaan is before you. A new season awaits you. With God's resurrection power, your best days lie ahead. God's power is more than a match for the uncrossable rivers in your life. Would you stand with me for prayer? Lord God, we thank you so much for this account of your amazing miracle of taking the people of Israel across the Jordan River at flood stage. And we see that with that, that you uh, can take us across our uncrossable rivers, that you provided us an inheritance of power, the same power within us that you used when you raised Christ from the dead. And so today, Father, we hold up our uncrossable rivers. Do you have something in your life? Would you just, like, put it in, the, in your hand? And would you just raise your hand right now? If you, something in your life that you say, I don't know what it is, raise your hand up. God, I don't know how I'm going to cross this river. Something in your life, you say, I don't know what to do. Raise your hand nice and high. God, we hold up our uncrossable rivers. We don't know what to do with them. We don't know how to get across. We are powerless without you. But you have all power. Help us to access that power. If we believe in Jesus, it's in us resurrection power. So God, we pray, take these, help us get across the things in our lives that we don't know what to do with, how to fix. We lift them to you today. 
If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do it right now and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Forgive me my sins. Come into my life. I want your power, the power of your Holy Spirit within me. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.